Okay. Um, hello, everyone. We're going to get started now. Uh, this is Jeanette Gaff from IASP. I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar on pain and dementia. This is the second in a series related to the 2019 Google Year Against Pain in the Most Vulnerable. Before I introduce our moderator, I wanted to bring your attention to some information that appears on these slides. There are several ways to participate in the webinar today. Uh, after the talks, we'll have a Q&A session where you can type your questions into the Q&A area of Zoom, and then we will ask those questions to our panelists. Uh, you can tweet using hashtag GUI2019, and you can follow us at IASP Pain on Twitter or like our Facebook page at this link, or visit our Global Year webpage to find out more information about the Global Year and all of our webinars. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator, uh, Dr. Keila Herr. Dr. Herr is professor at an associate dean for faculty in the College of Nursing at the University of Iowa. She is co-director of the SOME Center for Gerontological Excellence. She presents nationally and internationally on strategies for improving assessment and management of pain in elders and has published extensively on this topic. She is also the chair of IASP's Pain and Older Persons Special Interest Group, which you can find out more on our website as well. Please welcome Dr. Herr. Thank you, Jeanette, for the introduction. I'm very honored to be able to moderate this exciting webinar on innovations in pain assessment and treatment in the population of dementia. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenters today, and I'd first like to start with the introduction of Dr. Stefan Lautenbacher, who is Professor of Physiological Psychology at the University of Bamberg in Germany. His expertise is in the biopsychology of pain, and he has supervised numerous PhD theses, published several books, and written close to 200 journal articles on this topic. Today, he'll be he will be presenting on novel training to improve pain detection in dementia. Please help me welcome Dr. Lautenbacher. Hello to everybody. Sorry for using the buttons at the beginning. I would like to tell you something about new ways, new tools for pain assessment uh, in dementia. And um, before I start to do this, I would like to bring certain clinical and epidemiological facts about pain and dementia to your mind. Uh, as you see in the upper left corner of this slide, it's quite obvious that patients with dementia receive less prescribed analgesics uh, compared to cognitively unimpaired individuals suffering from the same somatic pathology. The question is, what is the reason for this undertreatment? And very likely, as you see in the lower left corner, there is a decline in the pain report in aged individuals uh, with dementia. So patients with dementia do not uh, report that often pain spontaneously than cognitively unimpaired age-matched control subjects. This decline of um, Communication very likely results from a decreasing ability to provide self-report. And as you see here in one of many studies, it's not surprising that with decreasing cognitive abilities, there's also a decrease of the possibility to provide pain self-report. So the consequence in total is that patients with dementia very likely suffer from pain unnoticed. To support this perspective, I show you here a, the results of a new a recent review with uh, several studies. And the question was, how does a person become a pain patient? And they compared the self-report of patients with dementia to the informant report. And it becomes, I think, quite clearly in this slide that referring to the self-report, the estimate of pain would be 
30 to 50 percent using the informant report, uh, the figures are much higher, so it's between 50 to 70 percent. So this supports the idea that pain remains undetected when we rely too strongly on self-report. What can we do to overcome the situation? We can use observational tools for pain assessment in individuals with dementia. The problem was that at the beginning there were no tools, in the beginning is the 90s of the last century, there were no tools. And meanwhile, here you see the, uh, a review of Sakal and co-workers. Meanwhile, uh, there is a list of about 20 um, observational tools which are available. And the question now again is, what is the best solution? And we have, in a way, after a total neglect of the problem in the 90s, an uncontrolled growth resulted into too many tools. So you need already, again, expertise to find the best one. We think that coming back to the idea of new ways, new tools, that a meter tool might be a solution. What is a meter tool? A meter tool can be seen as an attempt to integrate all existing knowledge about critical observation of pain in individuals with dementia. And where does this knowledge come from? It should be available in the existing tools. So what we did is not to study again patients, we started to study the available observational tools and we did this in three rounds. So first, we identified the best possible uh, observational pain tools, and we found 12 words for further study. Uh, having identified these 12 observational uh, tools, we could form, extracted out of these observational tools the items, and we formed an item pool consisting of 228 items. Um, in around three, we deleted all doubles and selected the most frequently used items, and this resulted in our research version. And in round four, we used this research version uh, to run experimental and clinical studies in several uh, countries and tested the reliability and validity of all these 36 items. This allowed us to select the best 15 items and we, we came up with the PIKE 15 tool. To, to highlight this again, these items have all been included in already established scales. It is only the selection of the best of the best. Um, here you see, the, on the right side, here you see the scale pain assessment in impaired cognition. Uh, it consists, of course, the major three domains which are agreed on that they are especially important, facial expression, body movements, and vocalization. There's no doubt about that the three, these three domains are especially important and relevant for the signaling of pain. And for each of these three domains, we included uh, five items which are all clearly observable, which is obviously sometimes a problem in other scales that there is too much interpretation necessary to make a, a good rating of these items. The features of the scale are published and the scale is meanwhile available in seven languages as you see here, English, German, Danish, Dutch, Italian, Spanish, Chinese, and you can download it it's from our webpage pike15.com. We were not the only one having the idea that it was time to produce such a meter tool to, to make a selection out of the available tools to find the best solution. There is also another meter tool, meanwhile, available, produced by an American research group, PIM. I pronounce it like that. And you see here is a reference if you are interested to download it. Um, so far, my thoughts about observational tools, and now to something completely different. One might believe nowadays 
that it's already time to use a computer and computer algorithm, automatic algorithm of pain recognition, so that we are about to leave uh, the human observer and to hand the problem over to a computer and a video system. Um, what you see here is there are several ideas so you can use one sensor, unisensor monitors, and you can use information from multiple sensors or multi-sensor monitors. What you see here, and I highlighted it by writing it in bold letters, facial activity is always seen as one of the most and the leading um, signal of pain. Um, what is what has to be done when you have the idea to use the facial information, uh, first you have to identify the face, which has been a problem for a long time. Meanwhile, it's possible automatically to locate a face and then you have to locate the facial landmarks. And after that, you can look for displacement of the landmarks or you can look for changes in the texture. An important change in texture is the deepening of wrinkles or the, the occurrence of wrinkles. And now you can go two ways, one via the so-called facial action unit. So in a second, in a third step, uh, the occurrence and intensity of these facial action units are estimated. Um, or you can go directly to the inference of pain and pain intensity. Both ways can produce estimates of pain the one via the facial action coding system, via the facial action unit, is a more transparent version because we know already what the facial action units are telling us. Here's some um, examples of problems. Here you see two phases, a young one and an old one, and it's quite clear that the landmark detection may run into problems in the old face because, for example, the eyebrow is no longer that clearly visible uh, in an old face. Another problem is, of course, using texture. The wrinkles in a young face may mean that the face has just moved a bit to show an expression of an emotion or pain. In an old face, wrinkles are existent uh, before such a facial activity. It's a result of a lifelong activity of the face. So it can no longer be used as a present um, indicator of um, um, facial activity. So these are the problems to overcome. And we have now tested one of these um, facial um, recognition systems, the face reader, and compared what the face reader could um, show us uh, as regards the pain-relevant action units, we have compared these pain-relevant action units uh, detected by this automatic system, the face reader, with our manual fax coding. And if there is, would be a good agreement, the score should be around 0 0.8, uh, 0 0.9. And as you see, there is, it's far away. It's not even reaching 0.5. So there is a strong disagreement between the um, automatic system and what our human observers, and I think the human observers can be considered as the ground truth to be reached. There is a large disagreement. So the, the automatic system was not able to detect correctly the action units relevant for the detection of the <coughs> I summarize my talk. So first, the gold standard of pain assessment, the use of pain self-report is still possible in mild dementia, but no longer in moderate and severe form. Observational assessment tools may add and or substitute and should focus on facial expression, vocalization, and body movement. There is a large number of such observational tools available. It is time to extract the best items of the available tools and to gain meta tools. Pi 15 is one of these few attempts. PIM is another one. Approaches to automatic pain recognition via machine learning are promising, but still far from readiness for clinical use. 
and it's necessary to use individualized systems for detection because there is no overall pain indicative action unit pattern, but there are always individual differences. <coughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Stefan, for that very interesting presentation. I want to remind the attendees that you will have a chance to have questions answered at the end of all three presentations. So you can type them into the Q&A box on the Zoom screen and we will try to get to as many of them as we can at the end of the talks. I'd like to now introduce our second presenter, Dr. Miriam Kuntz. Dr. Kuntz is Professor of Medical Psychology and Sociology at the University of Augsburg. She's an expert in the field of facial expression of pain and in the field of pain in patients with dementia. She's co-chair of the Global Year Against Pain in the Most Vulnerable for IASP and will present today on novel training to improve pain detection in dementia. Welcome, Miriam. Thank you so much, Kila. Yeah, I would like to talk about training that we can do to improve pain detection in dementia. And my talk is really bridging over or an attempt to bridge over between Stefan's talk on tools to assess pain and Wilko's talk on pain management. Um, because starting from where Stefan um, ended kind of, or his overview on the scales that have been developed to assess pain and dementia, like this Pike 15 scale. The question is now that we do have these scales available, now that we have tools to hopefully validly and reliably assess pain in patients with dementia, has that led to an improvement in the clinical reality? So is pain now better assessed in those individuals suffering from dementia. And I have here two studies, two recent one, both published in 2019, and they really come to a set conclusion. If you look in the upper part, I just um, selected a quote out of this paper, that in all five care homes that the study investigated, um, no one had integrated any observational pain assessment tools into their practice. Or from another study from this year, very large study with more than 50,000 nursing home residents, and they were divided in those with dementia and without dementia. You can see that in the group with dementia, 25.7, so nearly 26% or one a fourth of them did not receive any kind of pain assessment compared to only 7% 0.5% um, in those not suffering from dementia. So based on these studies, very surprising. We do have pain scales available now. Why are they not used? Why is pain still not assessed in individuals with dementia? There's also a recent study from last year that tried to investigate this by interviewing nurses and asking them um, why are you not using any standardized pain assessment? What are your, what you see as the problems and difficulties of assessing pain and dementia? And what is the use of these scales? So questions like this were asked in the interview. And here's just some arguments that the nurses um, stated what they think is still missing or lacking when assessing pain and dementia. And when you see these reasons, some of them refer more to organizational things like high staff turnover, but all the other aspects that I mentioned, I guess, sound problem. But it's not my computer, so somebody yeah, but now it's better, super. Um, but all the other things that I listed here, as you can see, they refer to lack of knowledge. So lack of knowledge on pain treatment and pain assessment in dementia, or specific lack of knowledge on how to use the scale. So lack of confidence in the reliability or difficulty in using the observational scales. So here, the main problem seems to be that knowledge is missing, knowledge on pain assessment, pain treatment, and especially on these pain assessment scales that are available. And the authors also say that the healthcare professionals emphasize a need for ongoing investment in training and education, which balance theory with practical application of knowledge and skills. So the need for training and education. 
that's the idea that if we have more training, if we have more education, this might solve the problem. So the question is, one could critical ask, is that really true? Can training really improve pain recognition in individuals with dementia? And that's what I would like to talk about now and give you um, some studies that have tried to look at this aspect. There are not a lot of studies available, but um, there are some studies that focus on one type of pain behavior, namely facial expression of pain. That's one type of nonverbal pain response that has been investigated a lot in the past. And we know a lot about the facial expression of pain um, how it looks like. We know that there are certain movements occurring when people are experiencing pain. For example, if you look um, in this figure here, we have on the top of the face, the contraction of the eyebrows, which is called Action Unit 4, because this is based on this facial action coding system. We have as the most frequent movement that occurs in pain, the contraction of the muscles surrounding the eyes, Action Unit 6-7. We have the lifting of the upper lip, action unit 910, and we have an opening of the mouth, action unit 25 to 27. So these responses we see over and over again, experimental pain, acute pain, chronic pain patients, these movements occur quite often. So in a first study, we asked ourselves, are nurses, so individuals with long years of experience with treating individuals with pain. So being exposed a lot to facial expressions of pain, are they better in recognizing and detecting these facial movements that are indicated of pain compared to people who have no experience? So in one study a few years ago, we just wanted to look as, at whether nurses are better to recognize facial expression of pain because this is an important non-verbal pain indicator also for patients with dementia, are they better compared to controls? These were mostly secretaries in our study. And we showed them videos. So they had no context information. They just saw the face of older individuals and um, where we applied experimental pain of different intensities. And um, we had healthy individuals and we had individuals with dementia. The face was video recorded and these videos were shown now to professionals, to nurses and to controls in our study, mostly secretaries. And we asked them, how much pain do you think the person in the video is feeling? And here are some of the results. First of all, if you just compare the healthy elderly with those with dementia, you see that both the professionals, the nurses, and the controls saw more pain in the faces of individuals with dementia. This is not so surprising because we also found that patients with dementia are facially more expressive. So they show more pain. And so that's why probably they thought these individuals were experiencing more pain. But more importantly for our research question here, the difference between professionals, the nurses and the controls, here you can see there was no difference. So in our study, the nurses rated the pain of the person in the video as high as the controls did. In the next step, we wanted to see what about the agreement? Do the observers rating of how much pain does the person feel? Does it, it, does it, is it in agreement with what the person reported? So with the self-report? So we did correlations between the self-report of the individual in the video and the observer rating of the nurses and the controls. First of all, again, you can see in the dementia, the dementia patients, the agreement wasn't so high. Again, not so surprising because the dementia patients had sometimes problem providing a valid report of pain. But with the healthy elderly, you can see that both groups, the nurses as well as the controls, had an agreement around 0 0.5. That's a moderate agreement. So not a high agreement, moderate one. And in clinical setting, you would like that the agreement is a bit higher because you want to base your pain treatment on it, on the observation. So you would like to have a large agreement um, with the self-report of the individual. So there's much room for improvement. And maybe most importantly, the agreement wasn't higher for nurses. So nurses were not better than controls 
again, to give you background, secretary having no experience or nearly no experience with individuals and um, with really clinical pain conditions, it wasn't higher. So just having very long years of experience treating or managing pain in individuals doesn't help you to recognize the facial expression of pain better. Maybe because in clinical context, you don't really need it that often, you can use other indications, um, but you would expect, or our first expectation would be that just experiencing a lot of pain around you would make you a better expert also in the facial expression of pain. This is not the case. So next step would be, do we need a, speci a specific training? Do we need a specific training just focusing on the facial expression of pain and how it looks like to improve the ability to recognize pain in the face. And this, um, two studies did this. We did this on the right side. I will show the data later. And another study from Canada did it. They um, trained people, they had a control group and a training group, and trained the training group in fa the facial expression of pain. A little bit like the picture I showed you, just showing or saying that contraction of the eyebrows is important. And then you can look at several videos. You have to try to detect this contraction of the eyebrow movement in the video. And then um, in, and by doing this over and over again, you really focus on the different movements that occur during pain. And that should you make you better able to recognize facial responses to pain. And the videos you see here um, are of chronic pain patients with shoulder pain, and you have high expressions of pain on the right side and lower mild pain expressions on the left side. And so here are the results of this study before the training and after the training and for the control group and the training group. And as you can see, the training group became much better in detecting moderate pain expressions as well as mild pain expression they were significantly better compared to the control group. So short training, just specifically on the facial expression of pain, helped them to be better able to detect mild as well as moderate pain expressions. And we did a similar study, but um, we not only used pain videos, because we thought in clinical settings, of course, it's important to rate the intensity of pain that somebody might experience, but maybe in the first step, what you need to do is to decide what, um, whether the behavior you're seeing is indicative of pain or whether the patient is agitated or frowning um, because the patient is hungry or tired or angry or disgusted by something. So you have to differentiate whether the behavior you are seeing is really indicative of pain or might be indicative of a different negative effective state. So that's why we showed videos not only of individuals experiencing pain, but also of neutral situations and why the individual in the video was experiencing disgust as another negative effective state. And we also had a control and a training group. The training group was really trained specifically on facial responses of pain. And the outcome was, um, you can see here, the percentage of correctly recognized pain faces. So the ability to differentiate a pain expression from a neutral and a disgust expression. And as you can see, the control group didn't really get much better just by looking at the video a second time, but the training group improved immensely after the training. So they were much better able to differentiate pain from neutral and disgust compared to before the training. So in both studies, there is an indication or the conclusion would be yes, short training, just focusing on the face seems to help individuals to improve their ability to differentiate pain from other effective states as well as to detect different intensities of pain. However, in clinical context, face, the face is only one of the nonverbal pain indicators or behaviors. So we do need training that not only focus on the face. In clinical context, we need training that focuses also on body movements and vocalizations. And also these trainings should best be 
widely available. So not only in a, a laboratory study like we did, like these two studies were done mostly in the lab, but it should be um, widely available. That's what we try to do for the PIKE 15 scale that we developed with the scale and e-training. But as you can remember from Stefan's talk, there are different items, items in the PIKE scale. And uh, here is an explanation with the video, so people know what you can hear, the groaning, for example. How does it sound like? You can see in the left video, narrowing eyes. What is meant by this item? Or what, the, what does the item resisting care mean? So we have special items, a uh, video, sorry, for each item of the field to help explain um, what this item will be. And then in the training, in the next step, you, the, you can see more complicated or complex videos. And then you have to rate this video using the Pike scale. And then you receive feedback from experts who also looked at these videos. And uh, then you receive a feedback. What do you see in the video? How was that scored by experts? So for example, looking tense was scored as between a number of two and three. Um, or then, um, for example, you see other movements than for body movements. There is a special other video that gives feedback on this. And also a video on vocalization. So you look at these videos, you score the items. You score the items and then you receive feedback. So to become more assertive about what these items mean, how these should be scored, and that you be, uh, also have more confidence in your own ability to use these scales to rate pain. Oh, sorry. Somehow it broke down. <laughs> I have to go back to the... Um, hold on for a second. But I can, while I try to regain control again over it, uh, Janet, I don't, somehow it's not starting. Um, but uh, what I can tell you, so we are trying, we developed this training now and now we are implementing it. So nurses are using it in the nursing home to see how does it really work? Does it really help them? Is it just wishful thinking that this training helps or does it really improve in the nursing home the um, ability of the nurses to detect pain and is pain assessment that then improved? Um, now the slides are gone. The next, but I can uh, continue. The next slide is we are just right now doing this study, but another group already completed such a study and to try to implement training into um, a nursing home uh, done in England. So they tried in the, it was a half day training, just how to give you an idea how these trainings look like, a half day training. People were informed in general about pain and dementia, but also specifically on body movements and vocalizations that can occur and also on facial expression. Ah, yeah. So here we are back. And um, perfect. So this, they did it in three nursing homes. They tried to implement it and with this half day training and also they received a short training on pain management. And um, nearly there. So I have, uh, could. and what they found the authors is that it was very successful, this kind of training, if um, the full staff team was attending the training. So in those nursing homes where only the nurses participated, it didn't really work that well. Um, it didn't really lead to the effects that they were hoping for. And only in those nursing homes where the whole team was involved, did it lead to changing effects, that pain was really more assessed and really more attention was given on pain assessment. So this whoever is listening to this, if you are thinking of implementing pain assessment tools into your nursing home, think about getting the full staff, staff team involved and not only the nurses, because that doesn't seem to help, but we need the whole team to be attending these, these training sessions. And I come to the summary of my talk. So improvement in pain assessment, and then later on pain management, that will be Ilko's talk in individuals with dementia can only be achieved first by developing valid observational pain assessment tools 
That was a bit Stefan's talk. We are very advanced in this. We have many tools available. We even have two meter tools available that one can choose. Um, second one is the training. We need to train healthcare professionals first on nonverbal pain indicators. So how do facial expression, for example, of pain look like? We need to train them on the usage of these observational pain scales so they are more confident in themselves to be using them and believing that they are able to reliably um, detect pain. And third, on pain management. Because if you just train people how to assess pain, but don't tell them then what to do, then of course um, this won't be used anymore, but it has to be combined with the pain management plan. And third, it is that the Inter, the implementation of these scales should be done in a multidisciplinary way and the pain training and pain management plan should have everybody on board not only the nurses but family doctors everybody working there in the nursing home to have a combined effort and thank you very much for your attention thank you dr Koontz, for your interesting and thought-provoking presentation I'd now like to introduce our final speaker, Dr. Wilko Ochterberg. Dr. Ochterberg is an elderly care physician and a professor of institutional care and elderly care medicine in Leiden, the Netherlands. His research focus is on the most vulnerable persons and is centered around three themes, pain and quality of life and dementia, palliative care and dementia, and geriatric rehabilitation. Today, he will speak about novel developments in opioid use in dementia it's not patchwork. Welcome, Dr. Ockerberg. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kira, for this nice introduction. I would like to uh, thank the EISP uh, much for the opportunity to present here. Um, I just want to uh, look for the full screen uh, option. Um, where is that? I can do it. Hold on just a second. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, um, many studies, as uh, um, uh, Stefan Lautenbacher already uh, told you, uh, show that uh, uh, older persons as a group have relatively many uh, conditions that are accompanied by pain, and also their pain leads to all kinds of disabilities. We, we also know that older people are relatively undertreated, all of them, uh, compared to younger people with the same condition. But if we look within the older age group, as we see here in the slide that, that Stefan showed you, um, the older, uh, it makes a big difference if you have cognitive impairment or not. Um, the studies that you see in this graph show that having dementia lead to lower use of analgesic medication. And these studies have been uh, done in hospitals, in community care, and also in residential nursing home care even in patients with hip fracture, again and again, under treatment has been found. Um, there are several reasons why older people, and especially older people with dementia, are undertreated. Because with aging organs like kidneys and liver slow, <coughs> slowly declining function, physicians should watch out for unwanted effect of drugs. Because these vulnerable people tend to have more than one chronic disease, which is called multimorbidity, they often also have many drugs, already something uh, that is called polypharmacy. This in increases the chance of unwanted drug-drug interactions or drug-disease interactions, and those also uh, uh, will uh, have potential uh, harmful effects. So when these frail people uh, also have cognitive impairment, many healthcare workers, and especially doctors, are afraid of side effects and especially mental side effects such as delirium. But very fundamental, the communication about pain is hampered in patients with advanced cognitive impairment, which makes co recognition and evaluation complicated and therefore physicians hesitant to treat. If we look uh, at the use of opioids in dementia, um, uh, there have been several studies with some conflicting results. Do patients with cognitive impairment receive less, more, or about the same number of opioids than cognitively intact persons? 
Therefore, we performed a systematic review to answer this question, and we identified 24 studies in which were 35 conclusions. Some of the studies had multiple samples or compared different types of opioids, especially the distinction weak and strong opioids was used several times. And we found that indeed some conclusions found the opposite, uh, that uh, uh, patients with cognitive impairment used more opioids. The majority of the conclusions, however, showed that cognitive impairment is associated with less opioid use. This is potentially worrying as it may suggest undertreatment of serious pain. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, there were indeed several studies uh, in patients with acute hip fracture in which uh, patients with dementia received no opioids at all. However, uh, in the, in the, the recent uh, uh, period, uh, there were some studies that showed uh, a different picture. There was a, a large register-based cross-sectional study in the entire older uh, Danish population in 2010 that was conducted by uh, Christine uh, Jensen Dam, and uh, she found that opioid use among older persons with dementia um, uh, compared uh, to uh, older persons without dementia was much higher. And uh, it was a large study with uh, uh, more than 35,000 elderly with dementia, uh, and she controlled for uh, age, sex, comorbidity, and living status. And um, she found that uh, of the, um, uh, the nursing home uh, residents in Denmark, 41% uh, used opioids, um, and of the home living patients with dementia, 27% used opioids, and the home living patients without, without dementia, 16.9%. So were, these were really high uh, prevalences of the use of opioids. Um, and uh, in the nursing home residents, buprenorphine and fentanyl patches were uh, very much used, commonly used, um, and also in patients with dementia, also home living patients with dementia. So the opioid use in the elderly population was, uh, was high, and, but particularly in patients with dementia and nursing home residents. And um, this was really worrying because it made challenge pa patient safety and, and therefore uh, there were many questions also in Danish parliament um, of what is happening over here. So if we uh, uh, look at those patches, which are uh, use have exploded in patients with dementia. They are very easy to use because you put them on the back of a patient and so you have no worries about patient compliance. But the, the fentanyl and the buprenorphine are really uh, uh, strong opioids. Um, they help the prescribers to be uh, sure about the compliance for several days in a row. For fentanyl, it's three days in a row, and for buprenorphine patches, it's seven days in a row. However, because it's so easy, the prescribers might forget to monitor and evaluate the effects, the effects of which we know are both beneficial and harmful. Another study in Norway looked at uh, uh, the longitudinal uh, uh, course of the use of opioids in, in several cohorts between 2000 and 2011. Uh, and in this period, the use of pain medication uh, uh, went up 65%, uh, especially the use of paracetamol. Um, the use of NSAIDs went down more than 50%, which is good because NSAIDs used in, in older persons um, are very worrying because of the gastrointestinal and the cardiovascular side effects. But the use of strong opioids also uh, went up uh, from one, almost 2% to almost 18%. So on the one side we have positive findings of the of, of, uh, use of paracetamol and less use of uh, enzymes. Um, but the, uh, the use of strong opioids for uh, often, uh, longer periods of time is also a little bit worrying. So uh, I was asked to uh, write an ed editorial in Age in Aging about this, this uh, uh, findings. Um, 
because I warned many, many years against uh, under-treatment of pain in the, in the nursing home and in patients with dementia. So they asked me, you are probably very happy with these results. But um, I, I, I was a little bit worried um, uh, that the introduction of these patches um, seems to have accelerated long-term opioid use in vulnerable patients, especially uh, without uh, monitoring and without evaluation. And then uh, I had this uh, remark that sound pain management is not just applying patches for many years as a panacea for all older persons' problem. Because uh, please remember that there is no evidence for the beneficial effects of long-term opioid use in non-cancer uh, populations. Another a recent study uh, also from uh, uh, Norway by Anne Erdal and uh, uh, Erlang. Um, they had a study on the use of buprenorphine in depression, and this was an interesting study, an earlier uh, study in which it showed that pain medication had a beneficial effect on behavioral and depressive symptoms. So there was a study on uh, the use of buprenorphine or placebo for patients with depression. Uh, depressed patients were randomly assigned to either the buprenorphine patches or placebo patches. Uh, and this paper was not on the effect on depressive uh, symptoms, but on the reverse events in both groups. And uh, as you can see at the left table, 57% uh, of the patients with uh, buprenorphine had reverse events that uh, uh, may be or probably are related to treatment versus 18% in the placebo group, which is a significant difference especially in neurological and psychiatric symptoms were related to the use of the buprenorphine. At the right, you see the, uh, that also activity patterns were monitored with activity trackers in both the buprenorphine and placebo group. Uh, in the buprenorphine group, activity at baseline was much higher, but the decline in activity in the buprenorphine group was relevant and statistically significant. The left graph here shows that the patient that, that discontinued the study medication, um, and uh, you see that the patients with buprenorphine, which is, is the uh, pink, uh, pink line, um, significant, significantly discontinued more often. Uh, again, suggesting that this was related to the harmful effects of the buprenorphine. In the right graph, you can see that these harmful effects especially uh, seem to occur in nursing home patients that also use antidepressives. It's the yellow line. So, uh, how should we pursue as clinicians? Uh, I would like to give some tips for clinicians, but the most important one is always start with non-pharmacological management trials. These often are based on relaxation, but also on, on physiotherapy, occupational therapy, music therapy uh, principles. They all can be very beneficial. Also, lately, there's evidence for efficacy of paro robots and many other strategies, also in these vulnerable populations. However, often you need to supplement this with pharmacological therapy, and here are some tips to help you. Well, first, keep in mind, uh, older people uh, have a change in metabolism and organ uh, 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 function, renal function, so start slow and go slow if you uh, for the dosage of your medication. Try to avoid uh, harmful medication like NSAIDs and the uh, use of uh, weak opioids like tramadol and codeine. Paracetamol is the basis. Uh, in neuropathic pain, avoid amitriptyline because of the huge anticholinergic side effects and uh, instead use, uh, for instance, nortriptyline. Uh, be on your guard for side effects uh, on cognition and mobility, so monitoring is very important. Be on guard also for undertreatment. Uh, sometimes physicians, uh, as I told you, are afraid of delirium and do not uh, prescribe pain medication. However, we know that also pain is a strong trigger for delirium. Uh, be, uh, be also be on guard for overtreatment or inadequate treatment. An inadequate treatment may be treatment for uh, 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 applying patches for several months without monitoring. So evaluate and always use short-term 
especially remember that opioid use in non-cancer patients or in palliative care should be in short, short term, uh, as the effects are not well established and contrary to the harmful effects. Use different evaluation methods because of communication challenges, always uh, also use observational pain instruments. Um, so, uh, to um, uh, summarize, uh, good pain management is not applying patches for many months. Monitoring is very important, evaluation, non-pharmacological treatment, and um, you can only do this in a multidisciplinary team in a holistic way. So, I would like to uh, thank my, uh, my pain team, uh, because they are the ones that do the real hard work, and uh, I'm uh, very uh, uh, happy to, uh, to be here and uh, answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Wilco, and thank you, Stefan and Miriam, for a really wonderful webinar touching on innovations in assessment approaches, on ways to improve practice related to recognizing pain, and then to think about some of the treatment challenges with this population of dementia. So I have some questions and we have about 10 minutes um, to respond to questions. So uh, let me start with uh, Miriam or Stefan in looking at the assessment approaches and the tool that you shared. How reliable is the PAC-15 in determining pain intensity or helping a clinician to judge what level of treatment they should be using? Should I start, Stefan? If you like, please. Um, I come from my perspective on the facial expression research, where I think the most the, the challenge we are facing, just looking at behaviors, is that people are differently expressive. There are some people, or you might also think maybe like as a stereotype, some cultures that might express pain more overtly compared to other individuals with other personality or coming from a different cultural background. And I think the problem we would always be facing is if we just um, have an observation of somebody um, and then compare it to another person. So in a between subject approach, it is difficult to say um, exactly how intense the pain might be and you might sometimes over judge the pain or sometimes you might think it's less pain than the person is experiencing. So that this problem I think will always occur, but I'm very confident um, that within the individual, if you think about the uh, older men living in a nursing home, if you know what baseline behavior this person is showing, and then you see how it increases for that person or decreases for that person, then it's quite reliable to know how intense the pain is. And of course, if the pain is really intense, you would also expect quite intense um, outward appearance in facial expression, body movement, and vocalization. But I think always as a kind of anchor point, don't look at other patients, but look at that per patient and try to always have a within subject approach that you just have as a baseline or as an anchor point the behavior of that person and um, yeah for the pike how good it is we didn't test it for different pain intensities yet or i don't know what stefan wants to add quite briefly we, we have a lot of data available in the publication i showed in my slides on the reliability and as we all know, there is inter-rater and intra-rater reliability, and uh, the PI-15 did quite well in both um, aspects. The problem is, as Miriam also told already, that uh, it, with some items it's easier to uh, detect the occurrence of pain in general reliably, and it's more difficult to judge exactly the intensity. This is, in a way, the major challenge. But with respect to the occurrence of pain, it, the PI-15 is doing quite well. Great. Thank you for that answer. Um, one of our listeners asked if the PAC-15 and the PIM are already validated widely. Are they ready to be used? And is there a special license required? Ila, with respect to the PIM, I would 
ask you to answer the question. I'll answer that one after you do. <laughs> um, but with respect to the Pi 15, I think uh, we did our best in, in two publications uh, published with Kunz et al. and um, Margot de Waal et al. published in the European Journal of Pain to show the validity of the scale both in clinical settings, which is very important, but also in a more controlled situation in experimental uh, settings. So we could use also experimental data and we tried to combine these two types of information. So it's a new scale, so it cannot be widely used for years, but as far as it goes for being on the market for one year, I would say it has already produced a lot of data on the validity. Great, thank you. And related to the PIMB, um, it's also a new tool. And so there are our preliminary papers out about the development and initial establishment of reliability and validity, but it also needs some further testing, particularly related to sensitivity to detect change in response to intervention. Um, related to special licenses, I think for either tool, if you're interested in using them, you would just contact the authors to get permission um, to use them either for study or clinical use. Like 15 years, or you can download it and use it. Go right. ahead. And there was um, earlier in the slide set was the web link for accessing the PAC 15, um, and you can get more information there. Um, Wilco, related to uh, pain treatment and opioid use, I think you raised an important point about, you know, we struggle to improve treatment, and so now we have an increase in opioid use, which probably reflects a response to try to do better with pain management. But now we have to step back and look at a balance of pain treatment. And I'm wondering, do you have, is there much evidence about the use of non-drugs and non-opioids for use in dementia to counterbalance the use of opioids? Yeah, the, for a long time uh, there was a, uh, there was not there were very little studies on the use of non-pharmacological management. But uh, lately there are some some studies in in which uh, uh, non-pharmacological management uh, have been found uh, effective. Um, so, um, uh, but there, there we have a lot of work to do to uh, uh, to look at all kinds of uh, uh, of, of non-pharmacological uh, treatments. But, um, uh, for instance, uh, the, the Sparrow robot, there are some studies that show uh, a good, uh, good effect. Other studies uh, um, have found difficulties in, in finding this effect. We also have this, this, this problem of how do you detect pain. Sometimes it's, it's, uh, so it's, it's a methodological question in, 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 in those studies. Um, sometimes it's uh, uh, staff rated observational pain scales. Um, probably it's better to have uh, um, uh, more objective uh, pain raters. And um, but there are there there is there, I I I would say there is enough uh, evidence now to to use that more. Okay, thank you. So um, a question from a viewer in, de in dementia patients. The recognition of PPSD is difficult to differentiate from pain. Um, is the work that you've done on the PAC-15 help to identify those behaviors that are potentially pain-related versus um, related to other problems? Well, I, I would say that that uh, we have a uh, we had a trial called STAOP in which we uh, use pain observation scale, uh, but it was really on, on, uh, on behavior. And um, in, um, it, it was a stepwise protocol uh, in which first you look at the, um, uh, like the, the stimuli and the, the environmental things, and then you have this pain observation scale, and you have, uh, a, a, if that's positive, a trial of pain medication. Because in, in the uh, analysis of, of the causes of BPSD, you'll never be sure what it is. So you have to uh, make a, a systematic analysis and a systematic uh, uh, trial should include pain observation. And um, 
the only way to know if you're right is uh, if it helps. Thank you. Um, so you've done a really nice job in this seminar to identify some innovative tools that can be used and also shared this, the evidence to date that we have tools that can help us recognize pain, but that the problem is that they're not being used and implemented. And Miriam, you shared some work about training and how educating and training staff is an important part of this puzzle. And I'm wondering if there are additional commitments that you think are essential to have in place to be able to improve the assessment and treatment of pain and dementia. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's, it will take a few, several years, I think, for the pain assessment to really be improved. But I really think since right now the situation is that a lot of these advanced stages of dementia or individuals with advanced stages of dementia are living in nursing homes, it would be great if more nursing homes would put it on the agenda and try to develop an implementation plan to try to get everybody on board, the nurses, the doctors, the family, um, and have like a, because there are trainings already out there, one could contact the authors or like our training, you can use it freely, um, which is on the internet and have really half day training where everybody is involved and put it on the agenda. And I think if everybody knows that this is important, um, everybody takes care of it. You have an idea about pain management, non-pharmacological, as well as pharmacological in your nursing home. That's the only way to go for an improvement to occur because researchers can research what they want and put these scales out. If nurses don't feel they help or they feel what, when you have a score, they still don't know what to do, this won't lead to an, imp lead to an improvement. So I think everybody needs to be on board. And as Vilko said, it's difficult still to know what can you do, what maybe you start with non-pharmacological management approaches and then you move on to pharmacological ones. So it's a bit of a trial error thing in patients with dementia, but um, one shouldn't be get discouraged because of the difficulty, but try to not let go and try to test different things and do it as a team. And then hopefully as time goes by, you feel more confident in assessing and treating it and then it becomes more routine in your nursing home. Thank you, Miriam. Um, we're at the end of our time. So I want to thank the speakers, Miriam, Stefan, Wilco, for your excellent presentations and for the attendees for sharing with us in the webinar about pain and dementia. And I'm going to turn it over to Jeanette Bass to do any closing remarks or comments. I just want to say thank you to everyone for attending and I apologize for the crashing of PowerPoint in the middle there, but I'm glad we got it back up and working. Um, our website has more information about the Global Year Against Pain the Most Vulnerable and a recording of this presentation will be there um, very shortly and then I think uh, Zoom will also email you a recording if you're not able to access it on our website. So thank you all for joining us today and I look forward to having you in our next webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.